Hey, and welcome to episode 12 of Think Like a Hacker. Once again, this week we're doing the news early in the week, and then later in the week we'll have an episode with an interview. So get ready for an awesome show. Hey, and welcome to episode 12 of Think Like a Hacker. This is a breaking story. It was published last night in the Financial Times uh, by a journalist called Mahul Srivastava. And Mahul did a spectacular job on the story at some of the best writing and research I've seen for a while. Uh, the story is about a vulnerability in WhatsApp that allows an attacker to uh, remotely target a victim uh, and infect their Android or iPhone device. Uh, the vulnerability works as follows. The attacker basically calls the phone up. The victim doesn't even need to answer the phone. And this vulnerability will allow an attacker to um, to drop malware onto the phone. Um, it turns out, and this is according to WhatsApp, as well as a unnamed spyware dealer, um, the uh, a company called NSO, which is based in Israel, has been using this vulnerability to um, to drop their own um, spyware or malware onto Android and iPhone devices. And the story goes pretty deep. Um, there's uh, uh, NSO actually has a history of um, their business is, is selling spyware to, uh, to governments around the world. And um, they make a piece of software called Pegasus that is a spyware for mobile devices. It allows uh, someone to remotely turn on a microphone on a cell phone and listen in as well as track the location of that cell phone and so on. And so according to WhatsApp and um, this unnamed uh, spyware dealer in quotes, um, NSO have been using this new vulnerability in WhatsApp to uh, drop their own malware onto these devices. Um, a lawyer in based in the UK was actually targeted with this particular attack um, on Sunday. And um, what's really sinister about the story is that this lawyer is representing someone in Canada who's a Saudi citizen uh, and that Saudi person is uh, is is basically uh, suing NSO saying that they share responsibility for what their software does it's not just the you know a government that um, uh, that that is responsible it's actually the maker of the software that is responsible and so in this case you have uh, uh, NSO who is uh, making the software that targeted this lawyer, and the lawyer is representing someone who's targeting NSO. So, um, really, really interesting story, and uh, uh, it's getting a lot of uh, uh, traction on Hacker News and so on. Um, one thing that I thought was interesting was that on the one of the Hacker News threads, um, Google Project Zero is a team at Google, a security team at, at Google that does some really excellent research. And they had a look at WhatsApp as well as uh, Facebook Messenger. Uh, or actually, I think it was WhatsApp and FaceTime. And what th they discovered some weaknesses in WhatsApp. And the specific weaknesses that they found were that they could get a phone to do certain things that should only happen after someone has answered a call. Uh, and that's from a thread on Hacker News, and I thought that was really interesting because it, it suggests that um, NSO basically found a similar um, issue with a uh, security issue with WhatsApp, but they just went deeper because what NSO are doing is they're exploiting, um, they're they're getting the phone to do things that should only happen after a call has been uh, has been answered. Um, and so this is an example of one of the uh, several companies out there that make uh, spyware and tools to that they sell to governments that can you know target individuals and spy them via their mobile devices and so on. Another company that does this is Hacking Team, based in Milan in Italy. Uh, they caught a, a bit of heat a few a couple of years ago for for doing what they do, and the Italian government has now. Um, regulated hacking teams so that they cannot sell their software to folks outside of Europe. Um, so they're basically trying to control who has access to this kind of uh, these kinds of tools. Uh, NSO, um, I don't know of any regulation that they're um, uh, facing that limits who they can sell to, and uh, they're uh, you know. What what they're saying is part of the story, and this is in the Financial Times article, is that they only sell 
uh, their software to governments that target criminals and terrorists. Well, the trouble with that is that terrorist by whose definition? You know, if you think back to the uh, Jamal Khashoggi story, Jamal was based in Turkey, journalist working for the Washington Post, was uh, saying some negative things about the Saudi government that made them kind of mad. Well, mad enough so that when Khashoggi worked, uh, walked into a Saudi embassy in Turkey to do some paperwork because he was getting married, he was killed by them, dismembered, dis body disposed of, and so on. And so, you know, there's a lot of governments around the world that... Um, aren't necessarily good and that can call whoever they like a terrorist and they are potential customers for this kind of thing and so I don't think that this um, improves things but it's a heck of a story I will post the uh, the link to the Financial Times article in the show notes um, unfortunately it's behind a paywall but I think that the story is probably broken this morning and is all over the internet um, so I'll post a link to FT I'll also post a link to Hacker News and uh, we'll keep an eye on it the um, uh, if you use WhatsApp and 1.5 billion people around the world use WhatsApp, and of course it's owned by Facebook, uh, the way you, you fix this, you protect yourself against this vulnerability is uh, WhatsApp released a fix for this on Monday, which is yesterday. So definitely download the latest version of WhatsApp so that you can be protected against this because now that awareness of this vulnerability is out there, it's not just NSO that's going to be exploiting it to drop their malware. It's going to be a lot of other attackers um, and you don't even have to answer the phone call for them to infect your device. So uh, definitely get that update installed. All right, back to our regularly scheduled programming. Hey, Kathy, how are things going in Phoenix today? It's starting to heat up here. How about you? <laughs> uh, they did briefly, and now they're cool again. We're uh, based in Seattle, um, back from uh, down south where it was a heck of a lot warmer. So, um, so yeah. But uh, we've got some interesting stories this week, and I guess we've got an, a really, really exciting announcement from our team, right? Yeah, we sure do. We've got a little bit of news of our own, don't we? Yeah, so the, um, the WordFence team are releasing an uh, enhancement to the WordFence plugin, which is uh, WordFence login security. And we're actually releasing this as a feature set for the WordFence plugin, the security plugin, and then we're... Um, releasing a separate plugin that has the, the same subset of features. And this is an enhancement to 2FA, and um, it's an enhancement to protecting your login from various attacks from the, from the internet. So uh, the 2FA enhancement is that um, uh, basically we consider SMS two-factor authentication to be legacy, and the reason why will become clearer as this show progresses. We have a... a a very real piece of news that illustrates how SMS can be used, even if you have two-factor authentication enabled, if you're doing that via SMS, how uh, attackers can basically compromise your account. Um, so we'll get into that a little bit later, but the new features in WordFence are designed to mitigate that specific attack. And then another attack, which is um, a very sophisticated credential stuffing attack that we've seen uh, over the last few months where, and we mentioned this a few times on the show, where an attacker basically has a, in one case, a quarter of a million IP addresses. They are using breached credentials to try to uh, gain access to a system on the internet. So maybe that's Reddit or Facebook or something else. And uh, they're making one guess per IP address. So it's very difficult to block and so on. And so the uh, the, the new login security plugin that will be released uh, about a week from now, uh, as well as the full version of WordFence, has um, mitigation against these kinds of attacks or, or protection against these attacks. So we're switching from SMS to using uh, two-factor authentication that's done via an Authenticator app. And we've improved your XML RPC protection. Uh, and then we've implemented ReCAPTCHA 2 and ReCAPTCHA 3 which will protect your login screen from those credential stuffing attacks that I just mentioned. There's some other stuff in here which is pretty awesome. Uh, you can whitelist IP addresses to bypass two-factor authentication. Obviously use that with care. Uh, you can uh, set it so that users will be remembered for 30 days. And you know, as, as I mentioned, we're doing something really unique here in that we are incorporating this into WordFence, but we feel that it is so important that we're releasing it as a separate standalone plugin as well. So you can use that separate plugin to um, uh, enable robust 2FA on your website, along with implementing uh, ReCAPTCHA, either version two or version three, 
to protect your uh, your site from these sophisticated credential stuffing attacks. And so I think you'll see the announcement come out um, on Tuesday. Today's Monday evening, which is when we're filming this. You'll see the announcement for the WordFence plugin come out tomorrow, and you'll see the uh, standalone plugin in about a week if. Uh, everything goes okay with our QA team. We're obviously putting it through and have been putting it through a very uh, robust QA process, qu uh, software quality assurance process. So that will emerge a week-ish from now. We felt pretty strongly about this, that we wanted the uh, WordPress community to have access to a robust 2FA product. Uh, I think that there were some really pretty decent products out there. One of them was Clef, which has now left the market. They're unfortunately not around anymore. Uh, let me just, uh, I just want to double check that with you, Kathy. They've definitely exited the WordPress space, right? Yeah, yeah, they're no longer, of it. that is no okay. longer available. Yeah, and so uh, what we've done is we, we're, we're creating a very robust 2FA uh, and login protection for WordPress and that is totally free because uh, we just wanted to make sure that everyone was, was safe from this, uh, this stuff. Now, uh, it, this does not include, the standalone plugin does not include the WordFence firewall, it does not include the malware scanner and, uh, and our, our many other features, but um, it, it does give you uh, very, very robust protection against um, uh, a pretty wide range of attacks actually that target uh, uh, credentials and that target your, uh, your login or your, your authentication system. So I am definitely pretty excited about putting this on my website, um, my, my various personal sites, and because I gotta be honest with you that uh, credential stuffing attack that we saw, I think it was about six months ago now. It actually scared the hell out of me, as you may have noticed on our uh, internal operations channel, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, I got to see a preview of the plugin, um, the new version of WordFence with this uh, new feature broken out and um, really, it, it's so robust, it, it's really cool. I'm really excited to see how our customers respond. Yeah, awesome. All right. Well, um, I, I know it feels like we're pushing our products here, but again, you know, this is totally free and of course it's open source as well. So use it or you know what, grab the code and make it your own because it is uh, open source under the GPL as is uh, most things WordPress or maybe all things WordPress, depending on who you ask. <laughs> but yeah. let's, let's not get into the GPL debate today. I think we covered that a <laughs> few episodes ago, right? Yeah, I'm sure it'll come back again, but oh, yeah. we have a lot to cover today. <laughs> yeah, we sure do. So. All right, so uh, first story here, uh, hackers collecting payment details and user passwords from 4,600 sites, and the way they're doing it is kind of interesting. What's going on there, Kathy? Yeah, and this, um, as, of, as of this evening, and it's um, May 13th in the evening right now, this still seems to be a, a developing story. Uh, so over the weekend, um, Catalan Kimpanu, did I say it right this time? <laughs> Uh, you did. Um, I, I asked I did. Catalan how to pronounce his name, and I got confirmation. So Catalan yeah. Kimpanu. We just call him Catalan, right? And exactly. you know we say that, right? Yeah. I just didn't yeah. know how to pronounce his last name. But yeah, so he had this great article over um, the weekend on Sunday about the supply chain attack um, that was happening, um, and Willem de Groot from Sanguine Security had discovered this, and um, through his research discovered that it appeared to be the same actor. And this group um, had compromised alpaca forms and PicReel, which is sort of a um, analytics uh, JavaScript um, package that people can, you know, put, call this JavaScript from this external source onto their site and that these JavaScript files had been compromised and were serving up malware to uh, these 4,600 sites. Um, and as of this, earlier this afternoon, they found yet another um, service uh, that appears, and the commonality appears to be AWS S3 um, buckets that had been compromised. Um, either they, the, the files had not been secured properly and they had um, some kind of edit access, or that the keys had somehow been compromised. Not, they're not exactly sure what has happened there. But uh, all of these sites were basically serving up malware that was being called in. You know, you visit a website, and because the JavaScript is on that page that's calling JavaScript from these AWS S3 buckets, uh, and those had been compromised. All of the sites that were calling from that bucket had been compromised as well. Uh, so PicReel and Alpaca Forms have removed the malware. And the Alpaca Forms one was actually very interesting because 
that malware that was associated there was actually sending data that people were typing into web forms to a server in Panama. So this appears to be another supply chain attack and it probably did affect some WordPress users who were using these types of uh, JavaScript functionality and pulling it into their site. Uh, it, it, um, hackers like to target things like, like this because you basically compromise like one JavaScript file, but it affects you know thousands of, of various sites around the it's internet. Kind of, like, kind of like poisoning the well, right? And poisoning like, the well, and you, you, yeah, you hit the whole village. <laughs> exactly, because everybody's going to the well for their for their bucket of water, aren't they? Yeah, every, everyone's going to the same water source, or in this case, case everyone is using the. Uh, the code that comes from the same source. And uh, if you manage to uh, trick the developer or the team or teams that are involved in the supply chain and delivering that software, it's a way for you to uh, compromise potentially millions of people uh, simultaneously. So um, yeah, I just wanna uh, make this very clear because I know that we talk about this stuff at a um, fairly kind of technical level, but to, to fall for this kind of attack you would simply have to take JavaScript from some provider, put it on your site, and that provider servers need to, need to get compromised. And, and that's it. So, you know, when you see these uh, really cool, cutesy things that you can add to your site, maybe a new font um, where, where you, JavaScript is needed on the site, perhaps a new analytics product, uh, a new widget or something like that. And, you know, we long time ago, many, many years ago, um, one of the projects that I um, launched was a, a web-based widget. And uh, we eventually shut that down because we did not want to spend the time and energy required to continue to secure that. And because we realized, and this was uh, years ago, that if that is compromised, uh, it compromises all the sites that it's installed on, if our servers are compromised. So it was a big, fat, juicy target with a giant bullseye painted on it. And we said, we had this conversation. And when I say we, I mean uh, myself and my co-founder who happens to be sitting behind the camera um, and he's smiling right now. But um, we, we basically did a risk analysis and said, no way. Uh, we're giving this away yeah. for free at this point. We've gone on to a totally different business and we need to get rid of this. Uh, I think, in, in if I recall correctly, one of these products, I don't know if it was PickReel or Alpaca Forms, but they had kind of stopped maintaining that thing that was being served by, via the CDN. And uh, so it sounds like a bit of a similar story, but yeah. the point here is that if you put JavaScript on your site and it's being loaded from a CDN, you know, content distribution network, um, it, make sure you do your research into who you're getting that from, how long they've been around, where they're based, uh, does the team seem like they know a little bit about security, they know enough to secure their servers and so on, because you're relying on their servers to not get compromised. And if they are compromised, your website is compromised, even though you haven't installed any PHP code on the back end uh, from this provider or anything like that. And so, as Kathy said, you know, just another supply ch chain attack, huh? Dark Reading actually um, had a theory that the GitHub um, vulnerable or the GitHub uh, compromise that we were seeing last week, that that this may be. Um, another situation where developers are mistakenly so storing the secret access codes in their repositories and um, the hackers are doing what they can to scan those uh, repositories to look for any kind of sensitive information. So that hasn't been proven, but it could be just another uh, facet of that original attack. Yeah, yeah. So guard your credentials and uh, make sure they don't accidentally end up in a repo, uh, especially yeah. public repos. But yeah, um, moving on. So a hacking ring stole millions by hijacking SIM cards. And that's really, this is really the story that I was referencing when I was chatting about the, uh, the new features that we're including in, in WordFence and in the, the new plugin that we're launching a week from now. Um, so the community, which is the hacking group in this case, uh, they netted, allegedly netted $2.4 million in cryptocurrency taken from uh, victims here. Uh, nine people have been charged. Several fraud and identity theft charges have been uh, have been laid. Um, some of the the, the group is um, kind of a young group. The oldest person is 28, and some of them are uh, are still teenagers. The hackers convince mobile phone carriers to transfer a phone number to a new SIM card, and that then gives them access to the. Um, the, the phone number and of course they can receive any SMSs and so if they have a breached credential 
um, and uh, they have the access to the to SMS messages that the phone is receiving, then they can sign in as you, even if you have 2FA set up via SMS. And this is the point I was making earlier about um, uh, 2FA via SMS being completely obsolete. Uh, this is the attack vector that um, is obviously no longer theoretical. Uh, this is this is very real, and um, you know, 2.4 million in cryptocurrency was taken using this method. So. Um, this was done uh, seven times. Prosecutors have charged three mobile phone company operators with accepting bribes as part of the crime. This, this is kind of an interesting aspect of the of the story. Um, it, it, it suggests that the attack here is a little bit less sophisticated uh, in that this is more an, an insider job as opposed to uh, using technology to uh, compromise those SIM cards. But um, yeah, SMS is vulnerable to a, a range of attacks now. So, you know, SIM card hijacking via social engineering, uh, via an insider threat, uh, SS7, which is the protocol used by carriers since the 70s, hasn't changed much. And uh, a lot of SMSs are delivering delivered via that. So, you know, also vulnerable there. Uh, so definitely uh, switch away from, from SMS or if you're thinking like a hacker, uh, <laughs> not suggesting you do this, but but if you were thinking like a hacker, you would, you would think that anyone using 2FA via SMS would be a very, uh, very juicy target. So avoid SMS, eh, Kathy? Oh, totally. And while I was researching this article earlier, I dove deep on SS7 and the, a hack that happened in 2017 to a German bank. And I'm going to go back and keep reading that story because it's just absolutely fascinating. And in 2017, um, they predicted that SMS was going to increasingly become more and more uh, under the radar of hackers. And it, it looks like that's what we're seeing. Uh, there's been a few high profile intrusions that have occurred because of, of um, SMS as a two factor authentication process. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, uh, in other news, hackers have breached three US antivirus companies, uh, <laughs> researchers reveal. Uh, wow, talk about uh, poking the bear, huh? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, it, it, we don't really know too much about this, do we? We just know that somebody's out shopping this information around? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, these companies are affected. Uh, the group is uh, uh, FXMSP Collective. And uh, the researchers that are kind of going deep on this is Advanced Intelligence or ADV Intel, uh, ADV Intel. And uh, they reveal that a collection of a collective of Russian and English speaking hackers are actively marketing the spoils of data breaches at three US based antivirus software vendors. Um, there's no list of the three companies affected, but they're basically out there on uh, on dark markets uh, selling uh, source code net and network access. Uh, the threat group FX MSP has a well known reputation for selling access to breaches. They tend to focus on larger companies and uh, they might be tied to the Marriott Starwood breach last year. Uh, the sort of word on the street is that that might be the case. Um, so yeah, they're, uh, they're you know, uh, hacking into companies, grabbing the spoils and selling that and the access. And uh, I think it's just a, an example of uh, one of the many business models that attackers are pursuing these days, huh? Yeah, um, as a user of antivirus, I'm sure people, or as users of antivirus uh, software, people are probably very curious who these companies are and what exactly is being shopped around. Um, and we're just gonna have to wait and see how this unfolds, it looks like. Yeah, for sure. So it, there's a mal malvertising story over here and, uh, and some indictments, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Um, a malvertiser behind 100 million bad ads has been indicted in the United States. This article came from uh, Naked Security on May 8th. Uh, the Netherlands extradited a Ukrainian man, Oleski Petrovich Ivanov, to the United States, and he's been charged with a count of conspiracy to commit wire fraud, four counts of wire fraud, and a count of computer fraud. 
uh, he didn't act alone. He had a team working with him and this campaign, and I think I saw this, <laughs> what they were doing at one point, but this campaign took o happened over the course of many years. And what they were basically doing is creating fake online personas and phony companies and they were contacting ad networks and basically setting up fake companies and fake uh, banner ads and and uh, telling these companies that they actually had a legitimate company that they were trying to drive traffic to. And uh, in one case, he posed as Dimitri Zaleskis, uh, CEO of a fake UK company called Valdex Limited. And two of the campaigns that happened in 2014 had uh, 17 million impressions. So 17 million people saw this malware. Uh, and the ad networks would say, hey, you're being flagged as malware, and they would actually like socially engineer <laughs> the situation and basically talk them into continuing to run the ads. Um, they do that for as long as they could, and then they just cycle into another persona and another fake company and get more of these bad ads into these ad networks. So basically, when you put an ad network on, say, your WordPress site, you put you know a little bit of javascript and then there's a pool of ads that are out there in this ad network and it cycles through all of those ads so we would actually have site cleanings come in and they would swear that they had been redirected to this um you know site that was trying to download malware and we'd go over the code of the entire site nothing would be there but there'd be advertising networks on there and sometimes these bad ads would end up on our customer sites and so we'd have to help our customer kind of troubleshoot what ad network might be um, might be having a problem and it wasn't just our customers it was situations like uh, the BBC um, Newsweek the New York Times and even um, MSN uh, were all getting infected by these bad ads but he's being called to justice now so it'll be interesting to see what happens with all of this yeah, for sure. And I thought it was interesting that he's facing one count of conspiracy to commit wire fraud, four counts of wire fraud, and one count of computer fraud. And the uh, agency that went after him in the U.S., or the U.S.-based agency, was the Secret Service, uh, and they coordinated with Dutch law enforcement. Uh, mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting that the U.S. Secret Service took this and not FBI, and that he's not being, or they are not being charged under the CFAA, but instead... Uh, conspiracy to commit wire fraud and four counts of wire fraud uh, i guess that just happens to be the one the charge they think will stick the the best but uh anyway that caught my eye yeah definitely interesting I... so i i have a question for you um mm -hmm. i when i was researching this i it, it was hard to tell if in this case the uh, the victim was clicking on an ad and then ending up on a site that was trying to get them to install malware or perhaps using a, um, an exploit to, uh, to install malware in their browser. I, I couldn't tell if, if that was the case or if um, the, the user would just simply visit the site where the ad was being served and then that ad had malicious code that would perhaps redirect them somewhere. And based on what you're saying about your site cleaning experience, it sounds like uh, some of the customers that were affected by, by these malicious ads, th their visitors were actually just redirected off the site. Yeah, or pop-ups would would fly up, um, wow. or okay. y you know the, the 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 favorite one that I always saw a lot of was your flash is out of date. Oh yeah, totally. <laughs> and um, yeah, those that kind of just malware that would end up in advertising networks. Yeah, well, so it's actually a fairly direct attack. It, it's not just yeah. you know if you click on the ad, if you're the one in a thousand people that actually click on the ad, uh, you 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 potentially get infected. This was just taking you straight off. Uh, potentially popular, very popular site, and and uh, and then going after you either, I guess, via an exploit or trying to get you to download something, huh? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, so yeah, I guess the <laughs> the lesson there is uh, if you are on a popular site and weird things start happening, get the heck out of there, right? Right. Yeah. It's it's well, I mean, in, in our business, we we've kind of seen what happens with malware, and so you're as a user, you're sitting in front of a computer and you're familiar with, you know, sort of the modus operandi of how malware works. Um, yeah. A lot of people are not familiar with that or haven't been exposed to it, and so they don't question it and they don't, you know, say, okay, I I better just 
shut down this browser right now and get off yeah. the site completely. Um, and so it really preys on people who are just not as as tech savvy or not as aware. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, just to kind of dive in there, uh, into that for just a second, our, our researchers run um, virtual, machi virtual machines that yeah. are isolated from the host machine and uh, they use that generally when doing research into, you know, if they visit a site that's got malware and in some cases they'll actually use a completely separate machine so that if, uh, if something does go awry, um, they can just trash the VM or trash the, uh, the, the QA machine. Um, so if you do decide to go poking around in uh, darker corners of the internet looking for malware, uh, definitely take one of those two uh, courses of action to protect yourself. Yeah? We have a little follow-up story to the, uh, the facial recognition uh, that we were seeing at airports. Well, I, I think the story is here that, um, that now we can opt out. So Homeland Security was, had, has actually, this is from TechCrunch, um, it was actually earlier today, uh, and the U.S. government um, is basically developing this facial recognition database, and the airlines um, like JetBlue and Delta have been the ones that have most notably been using this thus far. And uh, the, I think the big news is that we can now opt out from it. <laughs> you, can, you don't have to participate. Uh, Homeland Security actually from this TechCrunch article was quoted as sta saying that if you didn't um, want your face scanned, uh, you should refrain from traveling. Um, but now you can actually opt out from, from all of this. Uh, and another interesting piece of data from this article was that the facial recognition systems at airports are only working about 85%, so they're not entirely accurate. But um, yeah, they are. Their target is to get uh, the largest 20 airports in the country by 2021, and they are um, on target to do that. So I think the big takeaway from this article is that. Uh, if you don't ask for your rights and you don't um, sort of push the envelope of like, hey, you know, I don't, I don't have to deal with this. I can opt out from it. I don't have to go through, you know, the security scanners. I can get, opt for a pat, pat down, those types of things. You can ask. Um, the government is supposed to, you know, uphold the Bill of Rights. And so that um, I believe it's the Fourth Amendment where um, search and seizure and, and you have you have some ability to protect your civil liberties. Yeah, oh, interesting. Well, we'll see how that progresses. I, uh, I think, I, I suspect that folks are just going to get used to the idea that their face is a, a form of identification and, and get comfortable yeah. with it. But it's, uh, I think it's going to take a little bit of getting used to, huh? Yeah, I think it will take some getting used to. Uh, I think somebody commented like, wow, getting through security and getting onto the jetway is going to be so much faster and easier now. So the, con <laughs> the convenience, who, you know, what are right. they doing? I, you know, I've got nothing to hide. Just give me my convenience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, we'll see how that, uh, that evolves. All right, so we've got a little bit of a fun story here, and I guess this falls under the uh, more of the, the WordPress side of things since uh, WordPress is all about publishing and words and putting words online. There's a uh, uh, interesting change to Microsoft Word in that it's getting politically correct. Uh, Microsoft will soon preview a version of Word that will use artificial intelligence to make your writing not just grammatically correct, but politically correct. <laughs> Uh, let's say you write, uh, we need to get some fresh blood in here. The AI uh, might is likely to underline fresh blood and suggest new employees instead. <laughs> um, if you describe someone as a disabled person, the AI might suggest a person with a disability. The idea there is that the uh, person first terminology is preferred because it portrays the person as more important than the disability. And for the various new checks, Microsoft assembled a team of linguists and other experts to anticipate the poor word choices people might make and assemble lists of terms that would work better. Uh, this is according to Office Intelligence Product Manager uh, Malavika Rawari. And um, the AI's training data also includes Wikipedia pages. So, uh, you know, good luck with that, Microsoft. <laughs> I think there's some interesting vandalism that might happen there because uh, you know, Wikipedia pages get defaced and if they, if they ingest yeah. a defaced page and add that to their training set for their AI, uh, things could get, get real pretty quickly. Yeah. But um, I, I guess I 
am a little skeptical about whether this is going to be successful because uh, Kathy, let me uh, let me try this out on you. Um, we've got a guy in the organization that is really good at being politically correct, and or let's imagine we have a guy like that. Okay. Let's pretend his name is Dan. <laughs> Hi, Dan. <laughs> Hi, Dan. <laughs> we'll just throw you under the bus. All right. um, so, so what we're going to do is, um, since I'm worried that you might not be politically correct in your writing, we're going to have Dan review uh, your writing in real time. Dan's going to be staring over your shoulder. And as you're, you're writing, Dan's going to be uh, sort of poking you and saying, hey, you, you know, you messed up there. You could, you could make that more politically correct. Dan's basically going to tell you how you should express yourself and how you should express your ideas. How do you feel about that? Oh, Dan does that already. <laughs> <laughs> but but here's my problem is Dan usually gets my jokes and I'm pretty sure that this AI thing is not going to get my jokes. It's going to change all the meaning of my jokes and that I've got to protect the integrity of my jokes, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, the integrity of your sarcasm. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And Dan, Dan usually gets that. But yeah, I mean, this is essentially what ends up happening. And it starts taking some of the, I, I mean, each one of us as an individual in the organization has our own personality and has our own flavor. And I mean, you think about some of Mikey's jokes. I mean, there's no way I can come up with some of those, right? And if you have AI kind of suggesting um, different ways of communicating, it's sort of I don't know. It just takes away. It takes away our humanity, and I, I, I don't like it. Yeah, <laughs> I like. Yeah. I like our bad jokes, and I like. Um, and it's not to say you know that we're having all these politically incorrect jokes, but it's. I just don't think AI is going to be able to fully, kind of grok the flavor of humanity of each individual person, and, and it's going to take something away from the way we communicate with each other. Yeah, I also worry that the the, uh, the culture of outrage uh, on social media is a lot of that is centered around using um, politically correct phrases, and that seems those those phrases uh, seem to evolve on a continuous basis. And so, does this AI, you know, is is it going to keep abreast in real time with um, those uh, the, that evolution? And right. and if it does, well, well, whose version of it, uh, you know the uh, so, so yeah, I guess we'll we'll see. But um, it looks like Microsoft's going to preview this uh, this version soon, so uh, you can definitely check it out and make up your own mind. See how you feel about uh, word poking you when you're politically incorrect. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It'll be interesting. I I, I don't think it's going to fly, but maybe someday. I mean, I guess that people may want to use it if you're you really like have a document that you're like fearful of presenting to someone you might want to run it through there and just make sure that everything's just just fine, I guess. I, that's the only what reason I would see that um, to use something like this. Yeah, I know for sure. All right, well, in other news, uh, hackers have stolen more than $40 million uh, worth of Bitcoin from a cryptocurrency exchange. Um, the exchange is uh, Binance in this case, and it confirmed a large scale, in quotes, data breach. Uh, the hackers stole API keys, two-factor codes, and other information in the attack. The uh, price of Bitcoin and other digital currencies barely budged after the robbery was disclosed. Uh, Binance traced the theft of more than 7,000 Bitcoins to a single wallet. Uh, the hackers stole the contents of the company's Bitcoin hot wallet. And uh, Binance, the world's largest cryptocurrency exchange by volume, said the theft impacted about 2% of its total Bitcoin holdings. The, uh, the chief executive, uh, Chen Peng Zhao, said that it was a sophisticated attack. Hackers were patient and waited until they had a good number of large coin holder accounts available in the hot wallet. But Binance didn't know exactly how many users were affected as of last week. What I thought was really interesting about the story, so, so the reason we're covering it is because I, I think it's important to understand the risks out there on the internet in general. And if you happen to own any cryptocurrency or you need to pay for things with cryptocurrency and you're, you're storing that cryptocurrency in a exchange, just understand that these things happen and this has happened over and over and over again. Uh, one thing that really caught my eye in the story is that the CEO uh, said they, they discussed a rollback of Bitcoin to recover the funds and then decided against it. So what that means is there's a public ledger out there and this is how 
cryptocurrencies work when a transaction happens the transaction gets appended to that public ledger and everyone can see the record of the transaction and which wallet the money went from and to and so on and uh, that the integrity of that is preserved and you can never the idea is that you can never go back uh, so once a transaction has happened it, it can never be undone and undoing a transaction uh, in a cryptocurrency is um, it kind of breaks the integrity of that cryptocurrency and so they uh, suggested well they could just roll back uh, the Bitcoin ledger and get the funds back and uh, there was a huge uproar on Twitter about that um, and you know on the one camp saying this guy's got delusions of grandeur because he wouldn't be able to roll it back and the other camp is saying well this is incredibly sinister uh, I don't know that it's delusions of grandeur actually because this has happened in another cryptocurrency uh, a little while back called Ethereum, where they mm. actually, uh, about the same amount of money was stolen. It was also $40 million of, uh, of Ethereum. And they did actually roll back the public ledger, recover the funds, and that resulted in a, a, a hard fork of, the, of Ethereum. It went in two different directions. And uh, the, uh, there's, uh, I think it's called Ethereum Classic now, which is the sort of older version that refused to fork. So everyone, you know, who refused to do this fork is on that version of Ethereum. And uh, there's this newer version out there. So anyway, I don't think we should go into this too deeply because uh, cryptocurrency isn't really our beat. But the um, uh, what we really wanted to communicate here is that if you are accepting payment in cryptocurrency, if you need to pay someone with cryptocurrency, if you're holding cryptocurrency, if you're storing that currency on an exchange, be aware of these risks, uh, enable 2FA and know, know that even if you do all of that, uh, you may still uh, be a victim in an attack like this. So uh, the, the, uh, the anarchical or anarchic uh, world of crypto, hey, Kathy? Oh, yeah, definitely. Be interesting to, I, I don't think this will be the last time something like this happens. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's not the first and it definitely won't be the last. So. So, yeah, but um, it looks like the feds are spending quite a lot of money to get into locked phones, eh? <laughs> yeah, this uh, this was crazy. Um, I had no idea that uh, I had no idea that there was uh, technology specific to hack into iPhones. But I guess uh, the U.S. immigration um, has spent about one point two million dollars um, Immigration and Customs Enforcement um, at the border wants to see what is on uh, iPhones. So there is a company in Atlanta called GrayShift, and they make a pro product called GrayKey, uh, which has been described as the world's best iPhone hacking technology, um, and police and intelligence agents use this. It allows them to break into passcodes and retrieve information from Apple devices. Uh, the ACLU said that from documents obtained during legal process that um, Customs and Border Protection and ICE are asserting near unfettered authority to search and seize traveler devices at the border. Uh, so it, uh, it <laughs> I guess when you are crossing the border, um, it's search, search and seizure is, is kind of um, pushing the envelope. Uh, so when an agency, uh, ACLU staff attorney Nathan Wessler said that when an agency that insists on its power to search people's cell phones without a warrant spends this much money on technology to bypass security features on the phones, there is great cause from, for concern. Uh, they have also, Forbes actually did this research, and they found that there are gray key deals in both Texas and California. Obviously, they have rather large uh, foreign borders. And um, this allows them to obtain not just passcode information, but passwords stored on your Apple keychain. So if you have passwords that are being used on your computer as well as your device, uh, they, can, they can get into this. Um, other customers, looks like the FBI, the SEC, and the IRS are also purchasing from GrayShift. Uh, what do you think about this, Mark? Well, I think on the one hand, sure, it's reporting, right? But on the other hand, it, it just feels a little bit naive because I can guarantee the numbers here are, are, seem way too low. Uh, really? you know, the story here is that Immigration and Customs Enforcement spent $1.2 million on breaking into uh, iPhones. Um, so uh, mobile devices are pretty much the holy grail of um, targets when it comes to uh, um, any intelligence service 
uh, wanting to gain access to stuff. Uh, your phone, your smartphone has, um, I mean, so much capability, right? It's got a very powerful full CPU. It's got a GPU. It's got a GPS uh, for, for location tracking. It's got a microphone um, and and so on. So it's it's the perfect platform to compromise if you want to follow someone around, know where they are at all times, uh, listen to what they're saying. And you know what? While you're at it, just you know, write some software that actually runs on the phone that does local processing and maybe make some decisions about those inputs and, and does certain mm. things. Um, it, it, it is just such a juicy target. And we've seen uh, dissidents over the years being targeted via their mobile phones um, and, and many, many other people. And so uh, this idea that, um, oh my goodness, you know, uh, Customs and Immigration, um, or Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, spent, uh, uh, I think the quote here was, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, or in this case, 1.2 million, to, to, to try to access, uh, to try to bypass the security features on phones. Come on. <laughs> I mean, there's a, there's a defense budget out there that is way, way bigger than that, that uh, funds, you know, NSA and, and various um, other folks. You know, FBI is obviously well-funded as well. And there's a lot of uh, thinking and effort that's going into uh, uh, compromising these devices, researching them, researching how to break into them if they're seized and so on. Um, but, but I do think that, you know, it's a, it's a worthy story. And, uh, you know, it really does uh, pre present uh, rock solid data that this is, this is being done. And uh, over the, you know, as each year goes by, there's a public report on how many uh, devices are um, uh, seized at the border and examined and then given back to the owner. And that number, if I remember correctly, doubles every year. And it's a very small uh, percentage of, of travelers, but, but it happens and, uh, and it, it, is, it is increasing and it's increasing kind of at, a, at an exponential rate. So I guess uh, just be aware that if you are crossing into or out of the US or any, any other international border uh, in, the, in the world, um, your mobile device might get taken from you. And um, if you don't give uh, the folks access, uh, you from what I've gathered, you're going to be uh, detained and incredibly, uh, at, at, at the very least, life's going to be very inconvenient for you for a little while. So, yeah. But, uh, Kathy, I think that about wraps the news for this uh, this week, yeah? Yeah, it looks like that's it. All right. Well, you know, just a reminder, we've got uh, the WordFence release is coming out tomorrow with the new login security features. We're all very excited about that. And then about a week from now, we'll have the new plugin going out. So definitely keep an eye out for that. We'll be announcing that on our blog and we'll probably uh, chat about that a little bit in next, week epi next week's episode. But um, that's it for this week's news. Uh, have a wonderful week, everyone. Bye.